What's going on guys? Justin here and welcome to our seventh example video following our course on proof writing. Now for today's video we have a bunch of examples on binomial coefficients so with the introduction out of the way let's go ahead and get into our first example. Our first example says there are 165 three element subsets of a set A. We want to know what is the cardinality of A. So we know that the way to determine the number of three element subsets of a set A, we take N to be the cardinality of A. We know that the way to determine the number of three element subsets of A is to take n choose 3. So that means we can set up the following equation. We will have n choose 3 is equal to 165. Now there's a bunch of different ways you could solve for n in this situation, but I just kind of did it through guess and check. And what you'll find is that n is equal to 11. Great, so let's get into the next example. So our second example says, how many five card poker hands contain a three of a kind and nothing else? So the way that we are going to calculate this, we're going to need to multiply the odds for a bunch of different things. So first we're gonna need the odds for the rank of the three of a kind, and we're gonna multiply that by the suit of the three of a kind. Then we're gonna multiply that by the ranks for the last two, and then the suit of the last two cards. So the suit of, we'll just call the first card card A, and the suit of card B. So let's go ahead and write out what each of these are. So the odds for the rank of our three of a kind is going to be 13 choose one, and the suit for our three of a kind is going to be four choose three, and the ranks for our last two cards are going to be 12 choose two, because we can't pick the same rank as our three of a kind. And then the suits for our last two cards are going to be four choose one for both. So if you multiply all that out, you'll find that there are 54,912 different five card poker hands that contain a three of a kind and nothing else. Great, so let's get to the next problem. This problem says eight people are to be seated around a table. The chairs don't matter, only whom is next to whom, but, left and, but right and left are different. We have two people, A and B, that cannot be seated next to each other, and we want to know how many seating arrangements are possible. So before I get around to answering this, let's go ahead and draw a picture to kind of illustrate how this works. Okay, great. There's our picture. We have a circular table and eight seats around it. So to begin solving this problem, let's go ahead and begin by seating A. So it doesn't really matter what seat we put A in, but let's go ahead and say it is this seat here on the top right. So if we sit A here, we know that B cannot sit in either of these two neighboring spots. So that gives us five different possible seats for B. So we'll go ahead and write that five down here. So from here, it doesn't really matter what seat you pick for B, but once you seat B, there will be six seats remaining, and there will be six factorial ways to seat the remainder of the people in those seats. So we'll have five times six factorial for our total number of seat combinations. When you multiply that out, you will find that there are 3,600 different seating arrangements for eight people, which sounds like a lot. So that finishes this problem off, so let's get to the next one. So this next problem involves chess. So in chess, a rook attacks any piece in the same row or column as the rook, provided no other pieces between them. And how many ways can eight indistinguishable rooks be placed on a chessboard so that no two attack each other? We also want to calculate this for eight indistinguishable rooks on a 10 by 10 board. So let me go ahead and draw out a chessboard and I can illustrate this. Okay, so there's our eight by eight chessboard. I'm gonna represent our rooks by just a blue dot. So if we were to place the rook, let's just say here in the top left corner, we cannot place a rook in any of the squares that are in the same row or the same columns. So that means we can only place a second rook somewhere in the in this smaller seven by seven square. Because of this, all of our rooks must be placed in different columns. So for our first rook choice, we'll have eight different choices. So I'll go ahead and write down that eight there. For our second rook, we'll have seven different choices because we'll have this smaller seven by seven board and it's and so on all the way down to one. And then our third rook will have six choices and so on all the way down to our last rook, which will only have one space available to it. So that means in total, we'll have eight factorial different ways to position rooks on this board so that none of them are attacking each other. And eight factorial is equal to 40,320. Great. So let's go ahead and look at a 10 by 10 board. Great. So there's our 10 by 10 chess board. So for this part, let's go ahead and focus on the columns that the rooks are in. So we know that there cannot be two rooks in the same column, and that the rooks must appear in eight different columns of our ten columns. So we can choose eight of our ten columns in ten choose eight different ways. So now that we've chosen our eight columns, we can place our rooks in those columns. Well, we can pl place our first rook in ten different rows, and then our second rook in nine different rows, and so on, all the way down to our last rook, which we can place in three different rows. So we'll have this product from 10 down to three. I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite that as 10 choose eight times 10 factorial over two. So let's go ahead and multiply that out to see how many different ways we can arrange these rooks. So 10 choose eight is going to be 45, and then we'll just need 10 factorial over two. And that is gonna be 1,814,400, which makes for a grand total of 81,648,000 different ways to arrange the rooks on this 10 by 10 grid. 
So let's go ahead and get into our next problem. So for this problem, we want to find the coefficient of x to the fifth y to the fourth in the expansion of x plus y to the ninth. So we actually have a formula for this, so let me go ahead and write it out for you. So we know that the coefficient of x to the k, y to the n minus k in x plus y to the n is n choose k. So in this example, our k is equal to 5 and our n is equal to 9. So that means the coefficient of x to the fifth, y to the fourth in this example is going to be 9 choose 5. And 9 choose 5 is equal to 126. So the coefficient of the x to the fifth, y to the fourth term in that expansion is going to be 126. So let's go ahead and get to the next problem. So for this problem, we want to show that the sum as k goes from 0 to n of negative 2 to the k times n choose k is equal to negative 1 to the n. So let me remind you of the following formula. So we have x plus y to the n is equal to the sum as k goes from 0 to n of n choose k times x to the k times y to the n minus k. So we can see that the given sum is of this form where we have x equal to negative 2 and y equal to 1. So we can use the knowledge of how this translates to x plus y to the n to prove this identity. So we have x is equal to negative 2, so we'll have negative 2, and y is equal to 1, so we'll have plus 1, and that's going to be to the n. And we can see that that will in fact simplify to negative 1 to the n, which confirms this identity here. Great. So let's get into the next problem. Great. So this problem is another sum identity. So we have the sum as k goes from 0 to n of negative 3 to the k and 5 to the n minus k times n choose k. And we want to show that that is equal to the sum as k goes from 0 to n of n choose k. Now, we know by definition that this that this second part of the sum is equal to 2 to the n. So all we have to do is verify that this left-hand side is also equal to 2 to the n. And we're going to do that using the formula we used for the last problem, which I'll go ahead and paste in once again. So we're going to use this formula to verify that our left-hand side of this identity is equal to 2 to the n. Now we can see that by this formula, we have x is equal to negative 3 and y is equal to 5. That means using the formula that I pasted in here, we can write the sum from the left-hand side of our identity as negative 3 plus 5 to the n. And from there, it's very easy to see that that will just be equal to 2 to the n, which is the same as our right-hand side, which confirms this identity here. So that finishes this last problem off, and that's a good place to stop.